At number 10, we have the Huris. What are the Huris anyways? Well, they're described as beautiful maidens who await devout Muslims in paradise. There are numerous references to the Huris in the Quran, describing them as purified wives and spotless virgins. And according to Encyclopedia Britannica, some scholars actually give the Huris a metaphoric interpretation. It also has been suggested that the Prophet Muhammad actually reinterpreted angels that he saw in pictures of Christian paradise as being Huris. Moving on to number nine, we gotta look at Barak next. Barak is a creature in Islamic tradition that is said to be a mode of transportation for certain prophets. Most notably in the Hadith, we see accounts about the Isra and Miraj, and they state that Barak carried the Islamic prophet Muhammad from Mecca to Jerusalem and up into the heavens and back in the same night. Now, Barak is described as a white animal, half mule, half donkey with wings on on its sides and the word Barak actually translates to lightning or bright. Number eight brings us to angels and these are perhaps the most common supernatural creatures mentioned in Islam and angels are real created beings but are generally invisible like most others. They are not divine or semi-divine. Also, they aren't to be worshipped at all. They're just created beings. And angels, by nature, they submit to God and carry out his command without any question. Whatever God says to do, they just do it. And just to give you an example of the size of the angels, well, Jibril, also known as Gabriel, is the greatest angel and he's said to have over 600 wings and his height stretches from heaven to earth, and he can move faster than the speed of light, as all the angels can. As a matter of fact, angels are made out of light, according to the religion of Islam. Marid comes in next at number seven. The Marid are considered the most powerful tribe of jinn, and the word Marid actually means rebellious. They are the classical genie-looking figures that we would see in movies and, and stories like Aladdin. You know, when they rub the lamp and the genie pops out to grant any wish that the person may have. And just like we've seen in pop culture depictions, well, Marid they can change their shape and they're said to have a lot of pride and they want to show off to people a lot. Number six brings us to the Ifrit. And now these are a powerful type of jinn and are only mentioned once in the entire Quran. And in Islamic scriptures, the term Ifrit is always followed by the expression of the jinn. So we see that it's a type or class of jinn. The Ifrit are a very strong and cunning type of jinn and they emerge as smoke from the ground and they form into large winged demon looking creatures that actually are said to bleed fire. They dwell in the underworld, which is a place of punishment for those that do evil. Ghouls are up next. A ghoul is a demonic creature that is said to inhabit burial grounds as well as other deserted and abandoned places. In ancient Arabic folklore, ghouls are a very evil class of jinn and they were said to be the offspring of Iblis, also known as Satan, which by the way I'm going to talk about a little bit later in this episode. Ghouls are capable of changing form but you can always spot one of them if you look for this specific sign. Well, they actually have hooves like donkeys and they aren't able to change that aspect of their figure. Ghouls, they roam the desert, like I mentioned, and they often disguise themselves as attractive women that try to lure people away. And if they're successful, they actually go and eat them. According to the Hadith, an effective method of banishing ghouls is to recite lines from the Quran. Next up, I want to talk about the Shik and Nasnas. Nas. Shik is a lower form of jinn. It's a, sort of like a half creature or like half formed. And so they look very odd and they apparently go after unsuspecting travelers. And you know, the interesting thing is that it's said that the Shik, they're able to mate with humans. And if they do, well, their offspring is known as a nasnas, -nas, which look very similar to the shik. Well, they're half shik, half human. And these nasnas, -nas, it's said that they originate from the Hadramaut region of Yemen. Some nasnas -nas are described as having wings like a bat. Number three, I had to include the Karin on this list. 
Now, the word in Arabic literally means constant companion. And Muslims believe that Allah assigned the Quran to accompany every single human being that has been born and that will be born and that is currently living on this planet right now. The Quran push a person to do evil and disobey God's commands. So just to clarify one thing, the Quran, they're believed to incite humans to do evil through suggestions, but they can actually become good. And this has a lot to do with the good deeds of humans that influence the Quran. For example, it is said that the Quran of the Prophet Muhammad actually became a Muslim. However, it is uncertain whether or not any other Korean besides those of the Prophet Muhammad actually have become Muslims or become good Korean. Either way, we have two more creatures to look at. And number two leads us to the Daba, also known as the beast of the earth. Before the end of time, there's going to be a beast that will come out from the earth. And this beast will tell the world to recognize Allah as the only God that exists. Now the beast will wear what is known as the ring of Solomon and carry the rod of Moses. Also those who reject the message of the beast will have the word infidel written on their foreheads. Now once the beast appears it's not going to matter if a disbeliever then becomes a believer because the time for you choosing your destiny it's going to be gone and this is according to a hadith narrated by Abu Huraira. Now in the Quran it says this and when the word is fulfilled concerning them, we shall bring forth a daba from the earth to speak unto them because mankind had no faith in our revelation. And that's found in Surah 27 verses 82. So this beast, by the way, is actually going to audibly speak to people. That's going to be a big surprise. And number one leads us to Iblis. Like I mentioned, Iblis was coming up in this episode. And Iblis in Islam is the personal name of the devil, which is the counterpart of the Jewish and Christian Satan. At the time of creation of the human beings, God ordered all of the angels to bow down before Adam. But Iblis was living amongst the angels and he refused to bow down because he was made of fire. He's, by the way, a jinn in Islam, not an angel. So he's made of fire and he was like, no, nah, I'm not bound down to somebody that is not superior to me. I'm sorry. And because he acted so prideful and disobeyed a clear command of God, God threw Iblis out of heaven and that was his punishment. But his ultimate punishment is postponed until the day of judgment. And Iblis, who became the ruler of the jinn, referred to as the shaitan, tempt people to do evil and has become the ultimate enemy of all of humankind. So starting off with number 10, this one was a very, very, very fascinating one. So we have the Hur'in, and these are female type beings in Islamic mythology. They're often associated with the 72 virgins referenced in the Hadiths who await the devout Muslims in paradise. Now there are numerous references in the Quran describing them as purified wives and spotless virgins. Some however say that it is a mistranslation of angels or even metaphoric for the rewards one will receive in paradise rather than being literal beings. And number nine, we have the Daba. So the Daba is referred to as the beast in the Bible, but in Islam, it's generally taught that this is a creature that will appear during the end times and is one of the major signs of the day of resurrection. The role of the Daba will be to distinguish the believers from the non-believers, and this beast will light up the faces of believers, and with a ring, he will stamp and darken the faces of disbelievers. Barak comes in at number eight, and the word Barak translates to lightning or bright and this is a creature in Islamic tradition that was said to serve as the transport for certain prophets. So the hadith says that the Barak carried the Islamic prophet Muhammad from Mecca to Jerusalem and up to the heavens and back by nighttime. And number seven we have the Kareen. So the Kareen is classified as a jinn type creature although usually not actually a jinn but Muslims believe that Allah has made them accompany every single human being and the Korean pushes a person to do evil things and to disobey Allah. So they have a pretty bad influence on people. Moving on to number six, we have the Kiraman Katibin. Kiraman Katibin translates to honorable scribe and these are two angels called Rakib and Atib that sit on the human shoulders, one on the right side, one on the left, and they literally write every single thing that we 
do. Good deeds and bad deeds, everything. You name it, they write it down. And on the day of judgment, they will present to God every single thing that they recorded a person doing. We've reached number five, halfway in. We have the Sheik. Now the Sheik is a lower form of Jinn and it's a half creature or literally only half formed and so they look very odd. They apparently go after unsuspecting travelers and the Sheik is also able to mate with humans and if they do that, that offspring is known as a Nasnas, -nas, which looks very similar to a Sheik and I do not ever think I want to see one of those. Not even I think. I know I never want to see one of those. Next up we got angels. So in Islam, angels are real created beings, but they're generally not able to be seen or heard by human beings. And they are not divine or semi-divine. They're not God's associates that manage different regions of the universe. Also, they're not to be worshipped or prayed to. All angels submit to God and carry out his commands without question. Now Jibril or Angel Gabriel is the greatest angel and he's said to have 600 wings that cover the sky. His height stretches from heaven to earth and he can move faster than the speed of light as all angels can do. Oh, ghouls come in at number three. So ghouls are a demon or monster that feed on human flesh. You can find these living in tunnels underneath graveyards and according to the hadith, an effective method of banishing ghouls is to actually recite lines from the Quran. These guys are vicious, they're just evil and nasty creatures. And number two brings us the Ifrit. And Ifrit is a powerful type of demon and they are only mentioned once in the Quran. In Islamic scriptures, the term Ifrit is always followed by the expression of the jinn. So the Ifrit are a strong and cunning class of jinn and they emerge as smoke from the grounds and form into large winged demon creatures that bleed fire. They are from the underworld which is a place of punishment for evildoers. And at number one, we have Iblis. So Iblis in Islam is a personal name of the devil, which is the counterpart of the Jewish and Christian Satan. At the time of creating human beings, God ordered all the angels to bow down in obedience before Adam, the first man created. Now Iblis refused to do this, claiming that he was a much better being since he was created of fire and humans were made from clay. So for acting so prideful and disobeying God's command, God threw Iblis out of heaven and his punishment, however, was postponed until the day of judgment. Iblis, who became the ruler of the jinn, who are also referred to as shaitan, tempt people to do evil things. Starting at number 10, we have the Marid. The Marid are considered the most powerful tribe of jinn, and the word Marid means rebellious. They're the classic type of genies like you would see in movies like Aladdin, and they're often associated with water. Marid can change their shape, and they're said to have a lot of pride and want to show off a lot. Usually depicted with hands folded with a barrel chest. Number 9 brings us Ifrit. Now they're only mentioned in the Quran just one time. In Islam, the term Ifrit is always followed by the expression of the jinn, the ifrit of the jinn. That's how usually sentences are written. They are very powerful and they emerge out of smoke from the ground and they form into large winged demon creatures and they actually bleed fire. And they are from the underworld which is where the evildoers are going to go for their punishment. We have ghouls at number 8 and these are jinn that haunt the cemeteries. They are flesh eating creatures and they like to eat living flesh as well as dead flesh. They don't care. Sometimes though they appear as beautiful women to lure men. Moving on to number seven, we have the Silat. So these also take on the form of beautiful women to lure men and they also have intercourse with them and can procreate with them. These are akin to the succubus, but the Silat aren't always around doing evil things. Sometimes they do a bit of good as well. Number six brings us the Sheik. So the Sheik is a lower form of Jinn and also a half creature, like really like half formed creature. They look very weird and it's said that they go after travelers who just 
aren't paying attention. And the scary thing is that the sheik are able to procreate also with human beings and they can produce offspring and these offspring are called nas nas and they also look a lot like the sheik. Next up we have the hatif. So hatif is a type of jinn. They have no physical form, they're just disembodied voices and the hatif mimic the voices of people's loved ones and call out their names. And again they have no form but they always sound like somebody that you know whether it's a close friend friend or family member, somebody that you're related to. So if you do hear your name being called out and it sounds like somebody that you know but you don't see anybody, it could be a Hatif. So I'm looking at the Korean next up and the Korean they incite humans with evil suggestions but they can become good also based on the good deeds of humans. So for example it said that the Korean of the Prophet Muhammad became Muslim. However it is uncertain and is not really specified whether or not any other Korean outside of the Prophet Muhammad have become good for the actions of another human being. Next up is Hin. So scholars debate this whether or not the Hin are a subclass of Jin or a completely separate group altogether who rival the Jin. But the Jin and the Hin, they're said to have waged war against one another. And according to some accounts, the Hin supported the angels led by Iblis during a battle against the Jin that lived on the earth. Hin are also created out of fire, just like the Jin. I'm looking at the Jan now at number two, and the Jan are shape shifters who live in the desert and they take the forms of whirlwinds as well as white camels. Now, they're pretty open minded when it comes to humans. They have the power to hide or reveal bodies of water in the desert, and this is all just dependent on whether or not they like a particular traveler. The Jan are also the enemy of the ghoul, and throughout history, the Jan have protected quite a bit of armies that they have deemed righteous while stopping those who are seen to be unworthy. So history is greatly affected of whether or not the Jan step in like this. And at number one, we have the Palis. So the Palis is just straight up creepy. Like they are vampiric foot lickers that are found in the desert. And according to the legends, they are not that smart though. They attack people when they're sleeping and they drain their blood by licking the bottom of their feet. And since they're not very smart, you can easily fool them just by covering the bottoms of your feet and they're gonna be like, I have no idea what to do. <laughs> and number 10, hidden. So Jin, sometimes spelled with a D at the beginning of the word, well, they're supernatural and scary creatures. They were made by God, just like humans, and there is an air of mystery surrounding the entire world of the Jin, who they are, what they do. And as a matter of fact, the literal meaning of the Arabic word Jin, it means hidden or concealed. So not just that they are hidden and can't be seen with the naked eye, but things about them like their abilities, how they live, where they are, etc., are still a mystery. Although there is some information about what life is like for a jinn, a lot of it is still mystery. They literally could be anywhere doing anything. <gasps> what was that? Was that a jinn? Whew, okay, I just have to catch my breath there. Moving on to number nine. Jinn, they live for a long time. So we established that jinns, they live in the world and they're concealed from our eyes and they live in a different dimension if you want to call it that. And they also do follow a different timeline. And uh, what do I mean by that? I mean like according to my research, the jinn, unlike humans, they can live for hundreds of years if not thousands of years, perhaps even millions of years at this point. So like this means that they would most likely be smarter than us and you know, they would have a lot of time to accumulate knowledge and life experiences. Like we as humans for instance would live let's say about 80 years or so and we think we're smart. But imagine living thousands of years, having thousands of years of knowledge in your brain. Yeah, would definitely make the Jinn a very scary opponent. I'll talk more about that later on in this video though, so keep on watching. But for number eight, there are three main types of Jinn. They take many different shapes and forms and they have other names and types. And one source, a hadith narrated by Ibn I Masud, it said that there are three main types of jinn, those who fly and those who appear in the form of dogs and snakes. And the third kind is one that flies. 
So they're full of surprises, right? And I think what makes this so scary is that, you know, we as humans, there's like one type and we can't really fly without the help of technology, but there's no escaping a djinn. So if you even fly with an airplane, the djinn can fly and get you. If you try to avoid a djinn, well, there's nowhere that you can run and go because they can take on the form of an animal, let's say, and you may just run into it and you don't even know that's a djinn. That is scary. Well, number seven brings us the Kareen. So you guys know that our phones listen to us, right? Like you could be talking about buying a new car with a friend and all of a sudden, boom, you're on Facebook or Instagram and you see ads about cars and deals for new cars and all of that. And you're thinking like, oh wow, this is uh, <laughs> interesting. Also, our phones track our location. But still, in many ways, we can still protect our privacy from companies and the government and from other people. Just turn off the phone or, you know, don't use one. But there's actually no privacy at all when it comes to a type of jinn called Kareen. These guys are on another level. Kareen is a type of evil jinn that stays with a human being all the time. They're literally like assigned to humans and they know each and everything that a person does. And as if that wasn't bad enough, they encourage you to do bad things. So not only are they literally spying on you, but they have the audacity to make your life worse by, you know, trying to instigate you and doing bad stuff. Number six brings us Jin being powerful. So they're physically strong and capable of moving heavy objects almost instantaneously from one place to another. And in some cases, Jin powers, they can be controlled much like humans. And the person who is controlling the Jin's power, well, they can use them for various different beneficial reasons. Like one example is King Solomon, according to Islamic texts, who made the Jin build the Masjid Al-Aqsa, also known as the Al-Aqsa Mosque. They can travel large distances quickly, and of course, they can fly through the air, like I mentioned earlier. But outside of being physically strong and able to have external influences on humans, jinns also have the power to penetrate a person's subconsciousness, and they can almost force humans to do things and feel experiences. This type of phenomenon is called jinn possession. Halfway in at number four, Five, jinn are very crafty. I touched on this at the beginning of the video, but jinns are creatures with great intelligence. Like, you know, they live forever, they're accumulating a lot of information and learning a lot. So they can lie, they can give false information, they can even play tricks on people. So good luck trying to outsmart a jinn. In many cases, it would be like a toddler competing with a 30 year old scientist on a chemistry exam. Like there is no match when it comes to the humans and the jinn's intellect when you put them side by side. It takes a lot of spiritual strength and knowledge and patience to control a jinn. And how to control a jinn still remains a very tricky question because many people have actually tried to control jinns, but they were not successful. And in some cases, they lost their mental health and even lost their lives in the process. So trying to control a jinn is definitely something that's not recommended. Number four brings us Ifrit. Ifrit, they are sometimes in different cultures worshipped as gods, but they are not a god. Ifrit is just one type of powerful and evil jinn. The Ifrit is recognized as the spirit of the dead people. And especially in European culture, Ifrit is mostly living underground. So they may marry each other and they have their own societies and everything. And what's also pretty scary is that they can marry humans as well. There are many popular tales that depict an enormous winged creature of smoke, whether in the male form or a female form, but that's the typical depiction of an Ifrit Jinn. While ordinary weapons and forces have no power over them, it's believed that they are actually susceptible to magic, which humans can use to kill them or even capture them. But again, yeah, this is an Ifrit we're talking about. The odds of capturing one and controlling one, very slim. 
Number three, let's talk about mental health when it comes to gin. Some Muslim people believe that gin can be the cause of mental health problems and also gin can be the source of having people see visions and hearing voices as well as other undesired influences. Researchers in the Netherlands have found that up to 80% of Islamic people with a diagnosis of psychosis considered to be the result of a jinn. Now, Western medical practitioners, they often lack information about Islamic culture and religious beliefs. So of course that can make Muslims reluctant to seek any sort of medical advice when it comes to matters like this. But there is some interesting research that suggests that in some Muslim communities, medication and talking therapy for distressing voices is most effective when combined with traditional Islamic methods used to eliminate jinn influence on somebody. The scary fact at number two is that jinn target kids. This one is taken from an Islamic source, specifically the Hadith Sunan Abi Dawood 3733. And it says, Gather your children when darkness spreads or in the evening for the jinn are abroad and seize them. So this can be viewed as a literal seizing or a spiritual seizing. Either way, keep your eye on the kids at night time because the jinn are out to get them. And we end this episode off at number one, the jinn hold grudges. Jinn are not all evil. According to the Thousand and One Nights, in some of its tales, Jinn actually grant wishes to people and they also help people who are in need. But be careful though, not all Jinn are so kind. In the tale of the merchant and the Jinni, for example, a merchant is face to face with a powerful and evil Jinn who wants to take his life because he the merchant accidentally tossed a pit of a date and it hit and killed the jinn's invisible son. Well, invisible to the merchant, it was an accident, right? So although the merchant is able to remain alive, others may not have been so lucky. So be careful what you throw away. It just might harm a jinn unsuspectingly and leading to a very scary outcome.